Thanks for joining us for these CEU videos. Please take notes as you watch the video. Make sure to note any questions that are asked as there is a quiz at the end that you will need to pass in order to be issued your CEUs. Thank you. As many of you may know, especially in South Florida, is a, or it was a ficus hedge, but the ficus whitefly, uh, which is, I think, one of the most damaging landscape pests in the country, money-wise. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So when I first arrived uh, in Collier County in 2001, we were battling the Asian Sago scale. So I'm just going to give a little history. If anybody wants the inf any information on here, please email me. Uh, Doug Bug, it's up in the top right hand corner there, Doug Bug at ufl.edu. And uh, I can give you this history chart. Um, we have the most invasive landscape pests uh, of any state in the country. So uh, you guys in the landscape maintenance business are a whole lot more busy planning landscape pest management than those same folks in Ohio. So just doing a quick rundown. Uh, Weeping ficus serps 2004, pink hibiscus, mealy bug. We're gonna run through the key, some of these key pests, but just to give you an impression, the weight of how much has happened in the last 19 years, uh, a biggie with uh, citrus greening, 2007. And then, so there's more than uh, one significant new pest every year. So we're gonna hit on a few of these. And for you newbies, especially like when I moved down here from Ohio, I'd have people, uh, inquiring well, what's this and I go I'm not sure I'll have to look it up so you'll get things boy it's hard to interact with this uh you've all probably had questions about these little bagworms on uh, queen palms and royal palm trunks but they're not doing damage uh they're essentially palm trunk cleaners that's what I call them and then you go and look at any phoenix palm other than the uh, pygmy day palm but the Canary Island date palms, uh, date palms, and you'll see this scurfy-like material on the bottom fronds. And uh, a lot of people think that's mealybugs or some kind of scale insect, but that's actually, the f it's kind of a cool fungus because uh, it's so large, uh, the fruiting bodies, uh, graffiola false smut fruiting bodies. So you don't want to be using an insecticide to control a disease issue. So. First step, know what the pest is. Identify the pest. And there are some resources to do that with. An older resource is SP-235 through the University Extension Bookstore. It's about 20 years out of date, but I really like it. Oh, we have a question coming up. Uh, let me finish the intro. So. This talks about insects, diseases, and nematodes. So there's a slide coming up on that. And Michelle, I don't see the polling button. Oh, there it is. Okay, so uh, first question, new landscape pests are rare in South Florida. You have uh, 15 seconds to answer, right, Michelle? Something like that? Yeah, we control the polling, so we can um, turn it off. Did and I launch we it? see a, a good number of folks that have answered. So go ahead and participate in the poll, please. Uh, well, we got some people that are falling asleep, I think, already. So I'd say it's about time. Okay. Yeah, Doug, we've got almost everybody's answered. Um, we, one more person, one more person, and then we're good. So, oh, you know what? It's me. <laughs> ha, ha, 
I'm in as a participant. There we go. Now everybody's answered. So if you hit in polling down at the bottom. Do I chastise some people for not paying attention? <laughs> yeah. So hit in polling and then um, it'll ask if you want to share the results or you can just talk about it and then hit X on your screen and move on. X on my screen. I don't want to share. I'm going to be tight for time, so I got to move on. So X on the screen up here. Okay, so yes, uh, we have more frequent landscape pest invaders than uh, probably any place in the country. So that is something you have to be alert to. So in that same booklet, if you look at, uh, for instance, under Heather, it tells you the different key diseases, key insects or mice or key nematodes. So it's a good reference because I always forget about the nematodes. So that's something you gotta be concerned about. Uh, what helps is to categorize what kind of damage you might expect with these different insect pests. Uh, number one, I've got three categories. Number one is there's uh, just an annoyance and there's no plant damage. And I'll give you some examples of all these or ask you what you think. So uh, category two is cosmetic or where we start having some slight chewing or defoliation, but it's not going to cause long-term injury. And category three is a really serious one, serious threat. This pest will kill plants or ruin the aesthetics of the plant. So you need to do something about it. And some of these insect pests will fit into just one species could fit into all three categories, depending how abundant they are that particular year. So we'll give some examples as we go through here. So um, anybody familiar with Jadera bugs? I get calls on these. I've got ticks on my front screen door. They're gonna invade and suck my blood. So actually uh, they do like to congregate and it means you probably got a golden uh, rain tree nearby you need to maybe remove. So the jadera bugs feed on the uh, seed pods or the seeds of the golden rain tree and they're not damaging, they're just an annoyance. Uh, paper wasp, if you've ever been in the middle of a hedge pruning it and uh, been attacked, you know they can be an annoyance too, but they're not damaging, damaging the plant material. Okay, uh, remember how hibiscus used to be able to be a feature landscape plant? Well, we had uh, a new pest show up. When you see those buds going off color, um, check the buds, see what's inside. In this case, we're looking at uh, hibiscus bud midge and supposedly attacks orchid buds as well. On the right, we've got, there's some caterpillars that will do that occasionally, but uh, these don't threaten the value or the, it threatens the value of the plant, but it doesn't threaten the life of the plant. So you have to readjust those categories, one, two, three, sometimes for different aesthetics and different issues that you want. So uh, while we're on hibiscus pests, you've all seen aphids on uh, hibiscus buds. Again, it's no threat to the plant's health, but it's gonna ruin the reason you bought those hibiscus to have those lovely flowers. So question two. So we go to polling, let's see. Okay. Michelle, I'm stuck on question one. Okay, there's a little drop down menu next to, let me pull up polls. Um, so next to edit, you see the little arrow down? If you click Where's, that. I don't see edit. To the right. Ah, somebody just launched it for you. <laughs> it's launched. Oh. Do you see it on your screen as being launched? Yeah, how did it happen? Uh, we can all launch. All the co-hosts can do it for you. Co-hosts. Okay, yeah. so uh, they have 10 seconds. Go ahead and take the poll. The three landscape pest categories include number one, annoyance, number two, cosmetic, and number three, serious threat. This is a good way to help your customer look at different species on their landscape 
plants. Some people freak out with uh, just any insects at all. Okay, so I find keeping those in mind is helpful explaining, uh, especially category one and category two. Category one, uh, some people are, have that perfect apple syndrome where they don't want any holes or yellow leaves, but the plant's uh, longevity is not going to be threatened. So you don't really need to do anything. And that slides into category two, cosmetic. And then category three, serious threat. And a lot of this also depends on the plant species, whether you're dealing with the hibiscus, which are kind of wimpy, and any pest might cause uh, some grave concern to its longevity. Uh, and if you're look, looking at something like a ficus, at least it used to be bulletproof and nothing could damage it, or there was no, nothing that would damage it. So it depends on the plant's rebound capacity, if you will. Okay, so should we move on here? Okay, so I'm going to X out and get back to the slides. Oh, the Asian uh, cycad scale or cycad oilocaspa scale that uh, was first um, seen in 1999 and was here to greet me when I showed up in 2000. So this is what queen sagos used to look like uh, when the cycad <laughs> cycad scale moved in it was very destructive and here it's uh, identifying the pests is also important because this is a tiny armored scale which many people thought well this looks like downy mildew or powdery mildew so they were using fungicides uh, the wrong product which wasn't going to do any good so uh, the scale insect would suck the the foliage uh, and the dry there's just oops all these tiny little mouth parts, piercing sucking mouth parts. And uh, you can see here's the female, they're sort of shaped like a frisbee. The males are these little skinny white guys and eggs are hatching from underneath the female covering. And you can see these guys crawling out, they look like mites. That's the first instar crawler. And this is the damage, especially uh, May and September, there were two peak populations. And th this scale is uh, so difficult to control. There's more than two answers actually, and this isn't on the real quiz, but uh, each female can produce about 100 eggs. And uh, this picture shows, I did a test where I was spraying uh, soft products, different soaps, and uh, looking at whether they were alive or not, you had to flip that covering off. You have to flip this covering off, which is real tedious. Take an insect pin and put them under a microscope, flip that covering off, and underneath are these little blobs that are the female scale. And you can see all these eggs she's produced in their hatching and producing crawlers. So this is how you had to determine what was effective. And uh, you can see this is just a half inch section under a microscope that was over uh, a thousand individuals. So they just overwhelm the plant. And they not only feed where scales normally feed, they feed underneath uh, the bracts and the dead stem tissue and even sagos are kind of unique. They got this layer. It's almost like a sweater, this woolly stuff. And you tear into that and they're underneath there. So contact sprays, foliar sprays aren't going to do you much good. You can clean up the scales on the top, but you uh, will have scales feeding underneath in hidden areas. You can see it. this is very unique. They feed on the roots, probably more in a nursery situation than in the landscape and you'll find them on the uh, pups. Pups are scale magnets and you peel those pups apart. It's like an onion and you'll find scales in the different layers. So uh, the best way to go with talking about IPM is looking at having a predator and parasite 
So since it's from a foreign country, these things explode. There's no natural predators and parasites to regulate the populations. But the USDA entomologists did get to go on a field trip and they brought some of those uh, good bugs back. Uh, one was this beetle, tiny little beetle. You can see how small it is compared to Abe Lincoln on a penny. So it looks like a little lady beetle. It's not actually a lady beetle, but uh, it turns out they aren't real effective. Uh, this is a larva of this little beetle. And uh, they're kind of like a kid in a candy shop where they're eating the eggs of these scale insects, like, uh, like can candy uh, gumdrops. Just rip it through there, but they had very little impact. So uh, we tried the soft pesticides with the soaps and the uh, different uh, oils, fish oils, that uh, smelled more than uh, they were effective. So I don't know how that's gonna work for you guys. But uh, anyway, we had to start looking at something that had uh, some systemic impact because they feed anywhere on that plant. So we had merit prior to 2004. Merit does not work on armored scales. So uh, Safari is related to merit and its common name is Dinotefuran and it's very effective on armored scales. So it showed up about four years, five years after the scale did, so it didn't help us too much in the south of the state, but it did uh, help in the north of the state where it was slowly, the sago scale was slowly invading. So a couple of soil root applications of that a year uh, help uh, eliminate or greatly reduce that scale. Uh, green light's another uh, producer of Dinotefuran products. And IPM, look at an alternative plant that has a similar form in the landscape. You can look at uh, Dionne's, very beautiful, slow growing, expensive. They don't get the scale. Agave has a similar form. Uh, in the background, you see a queen uh, sago that was ravaged by the scales. So look at alternative plants that don't have the pest problems. Okay, I think we got a question coming up here. Where'd it go? Did I lose it? Let's see. Do you want me to launch the poll? Yeah, here we go. Yeah, please. Question three. It's launched. Somebody did it for me. Okay, it kind of reads a little out of sync there. It should, the small category three white scales, category three because it is a killer, but what kind of scale is it? It's important when it, you're deciding what, what product to use. Okay, so you all probably remember that uh, imidacloprid or Merit's good on soft scales and mealy bugs while we're talking about it as well. But if you're dealing with an armored scale, which uh, does not produce honeydew, by the way, armored scale, you want to select uh, Dinotefuran as a soil root trench. And we like to do soil root trenches because if you're spraying, you're also taking out the good guys. And we'll talk about that more. So. If you can, try and do the soil root trenches where you're selecting uh, management for the bad guys that are feeding on the plant. Okay, I see there's a raised hand somewhere. Michelle, are you doing the raised hands or? Uh, I didn't get a raised hand icon, actually. So I think I, we'll... I, I'm monitoring. We've got Susan and I'm monitoring too. The raised hand is really just for them to identify when you say how many of you have seen then they can raise their hands but if they need to talk with us they need to either put it in the chat or in the question and answer uh, okay excellent okay moving along okay so aphids uh when you see uh this black sooty mold which is a product of some kind of sucking up insect up there in that royal palm it used to be 10 years ago or whatever that it was uh, palm aphids, but 
with the advent of the rugose spiraling white fly could be rugose spiraling white flies feeding up there in the uh, royal palm canopy. So uh, regardless, the treatment product would be the same. Okay, so uh, the palm aphid loves these uh, European fan palms. So you all know how sooty mold uh, comes about, right? So you've got excretion from the aphids, which is a liquid excretion called honeydew for some reason. And that honeydew ends up on anything down below. And as it accumulates, usually during the winter when there's less rain, less rain or wind during the summer, there's more rain and wind to kind of wash it off. So uh, you'll see it more during the winter. That's when the sooty mold will develop. The sooty mold is not attacking the plant. It's blocking photosynthesis, so it's not something that you necessarily want, uh, both from an aesthetic as well as reducing photosynthesis, but it's not directly attacking the plant. Here's a close-up of the aphid. It doesn't look much like a typical aphid. The little guys do. These are like the first, second instars. And uh, as they settle in, they look more like a type of white fly immature stage than a, a true aphid, but they're in the aphid group. And uh, this is uh, a good population on viburnum. And you see these guys know where the vascular pipelines are. So you've got the mid rib or mid, uh, mid vein, and then you got these secondary veins. And these are guys, these aphids are like hogs at the feeding trough. So they know where uh, the main vascular flow is. Interestingly, I've, I've never noticed uh, sooty mold on uh, viburnums from these aphids. Uh, a symptom you might see is twisting and curling of the leaves caused by the aphid feeding. This is orange jasmine and my first thought when I'm diagnosing is, oh, that looks like herbicide injury, but in fact, take a closer look and you'll see aphids underneath. And I call those the curlers. Jude, <laughs> got some background noise here. So uh, another type of group of aphids is what I call the drippers. So uh, here's a bark aphid. He's got a stylet stuck in the vascular pipelines. And you can see he's filtering out different nitrogen products, but the sugars and extra water in those vascular pipelines is just being run through the aphid. And uh, I was alerted to a really cool uh, video by George Zaden, Z-A-I-D-A-N. If you just go uh, to YouTube and search Zaden, Z-A-I-D-A-N, uh, he did a, a cartoon video on uh, aphids and honeydew. And uh, I'm not sure if his sources are accurate, but he says, if the vascular flow in those pipelines is at nine times the pressure that you have in a car, car tire. So nine times a car tire, PSI. So you got some major pressure in those vascular pipelines, which I never really considered, but that's uh, one reason you get so much honeydew. It's just being run through those aphids. And uh, here's Podocarpus, gray aphids. You get a lot of honeydew with those guys. And crepe myrtle aphids, another uh, problem as you go farther north. I, I haven't seen those many, that many aphids on crepe myrtles down here, but uh, for some reason we're starting to use those more. I see them more uh, North Florida and Georgia. Another type of aphid is uh, woolly aphids, and we see these usually uh, October, November. People get a, alarmed about this. Aphids in general, I say maybe a category two. You know, with the way plants grow in South Florida where you have uh, essentially they're growing 24 seven and 11 months out of the year, it, it's hard to slow them down. So it's gonna take something uh, pretty major as far as an insect feeding pest to uh, slow them down and cause damage, but we're gonna cover a few of those. So uh, woolly aphids are not those. They're a category one, aesthetic annoyance. People call in in October and they say, oh, it's like dryer lint. Somebody blew dryer lint all over the lower canopy. 
uh, my trees and, and it's like, well, just consider it an extra free Halloween, Halloween decoration. It's uh, nothing to worry about. And it, it's kind of uh, puzzling to me because you'll see hundreds of aphids. You scrape off that lint, if you will, the waxy material, and you see hundreds of aphids underneath there, but I never see any necrosis or yellowing or damage. And it's kind of towards the ends of the year, so it's it's category one, no big deal, who cares? Just an aesthetic deal. All right, Exoras, uh, scale magnets. You can see uh, these guys are pretty covered up with the sooty mold. So that means take a closer look and see what you have. Is it aphids, is it mealybugs, is it soft scales? So you can see, it's like a red flag, but it's black. So you got a black flag here saying, I've got a bug problem, come take a closer look. And upon closer inspection, you'll see, what would you call these? Uh, well, these are the green scale, green scale uh, species that you'll see on citrus and uh, different jasmines, gardenias. Uh, it's got a fairly wide range of host that will attack. So here's, here's mama scale here. I think this one was either parasitized, this brown one here, parasitized or attacked by a fungus. And from underneath mama, you get these little first instar scale crawlers emerging and they disperse to other areas of the plant. So uh, 2009, croton scale showed up on uh, gumbo limbo and you can hardly tell this is gumbo limbo. It's just so soaked in uh, the black sooty mold. And you can see the scale insects on the stems here. So I, I think what happened was when the uh, Rugus spiraling whitefly showed up, it kind of chased the croton scales off the gumbo limbos because the uh, spiraling whiteflies like the gumbo limbos. And it seemed like the croton scales moved on to uh, Crotons. This was an unknown species to science until uh, I think it was Stephen Brown oops, discovered it in his backyard. Let me get back up here. That's the rumor. I don't know if that's a fact. Stephen can talk on that. But uh, so here's uh, what it looks like without the sooty mold. Uh, I'd like to say you could use a soil root drench merit on this scale if it's on crotons because it I don't consider crotons a nectar plant but I do consider firebush that's a huge nectar plant for bees and butterflies so you dare not use a root soil drench systemic on firebush. Best thing you can do is pruning and a, a two percent mineral oil solution spray. So this is definitely a cat category three pest. It will kill crotons and uh, firebush, and it can really put a hurt on the gumbo limbos. So uh, if you see these little uh, creatures here, I uh, should have made this a question. What do you think those are? Okay, trying to interact here. Uh, so <laughs> I've had homeowners pick these off and bring them into the office and they go, I'm trying to kill these mealybugs, but hey, guess what? These are not mealybugs. These are uh, the larval stage of a good guy, uh, of a lady beetle. Just type it in the chat whenever you, um, whenever Doug's asking for answers like that, just type it in the chat. And Doug, don't forget you have poll questions. Okay, yep. Did I skip one? I don't know which ones relate to the PowerPoint. The next okay, one is asking which insects create honeydew. Uh, okay, where'd that go? I missed it, sorry. Is it showing? The poll says, which insect does not produce honeydew? I can launch it now if you'd like, if you've already passed that slide. Yeah, you know, part of the problem is this uh, little panel the Zoom okay. panel sometimes covers up my... Okay, I'm me. launching it now, so if everyone would go ahead and answer the... Thank you. Mm -hmm. Question number four, which insect does not produce honeydew? So you've got soft scales, mealybugs, aphids, 
armored scales. Remember the Asian sago scale was an armored scale. And even if you don't know the answer, please answer. This is how we are tracking to be sure that you're on. Um, so, oh, somebody closed the poll by accident. Okay, I'm going to relaunch the poll because it got closed. All right, sorry. Everybody has to vote on this one again. <laughs> Just be careful you don't hit in polling until everybody's got their answer in. But yes, this is how we track attendance. So please, if, even if you don't know the answer, go ahead and answer something and then we'll know you're still on with us. Which insect does not produce honeydew? We have three folks out there. We're, oh, here they come. I'm gonna call you out. <laughs> All right, we're good. Okay, so as you remember, armored scales do not produce honeydew. Okay, so I'm exiting and getting back to these little fuzzy white creatures that look, look forever like uh, mealybugs, but they're actually the larval stage of uh, this lady beetle that's trying to feed on your croton scales. Croton scales are on the uh, uh, gumbo limbos as well. So they're kind of cool creatures. Also, the lady beetle larvae move a lot faster than mealybugs. It's another way to determine what it is. Here's what the adult lady beetle looks like of the uh, Species that prefers uh, the croton scales, so that's a good bug. We don't want to uh, kill them with sprays. And then we've got a whole uh, slew of mealybugs in South Florida, and they are a big plant pest group. So the one in the uh, center there is the pink hibiscus mealybug, and that's caused us a whole lot of problems. Here's symptoms on a uh, weeping pink hibiscus. Uh, be just because it has pink flowers doesn't mean it's gonna get the mealybug. The mealybug will attack any color flower, flowering hibiscus. The news media said, look out for your pink hibiscus because this mealybug's gonna cause damage. Well, it's any kind of hibiscus. So it, uh, it's feeding causes a telescoping of the inner nodes. It almost looks like roundup damage, as well as these extreme curling and distortion and thickening of the leaf tissue. So this is 2004. They've released uh, parasites, parasitic wasp, which has helped manage and almost, uh, I'd say it's not that big of an issue anymore, but uh, it's always going to be out there. And how do you tell it's a pink hibiscus mealybug? Well, you'll have to uh, Look close here, and uh, if you've got a little pin, you can jab them and see if their blood, they call it hemolymph, if they leak out uh, pink body fluids. Uh, most mealy, mealybugs are yellow or clear body fluids, but uh, severe distortion and death hibiscus, definitely a category three insect pest. And it supposedly attacks these other plants, uh, but I've not seen it on anything other than hibiscus. So there's a story as to why we have that parasitic wasp to help suppress a mealybug on an ornamental. They were getting gearing up for it. Actually, USDA was gearing up for it occurring on some of our field crops. So they were raising these uh, parasitic wasps. I call them micro wasp. And uh, it actually ended up benefiting the landscape industry more than some of these other fruit crop industries because uh, they didn't have the problem. So we benefited. Okay, question four. Let's see my polling. Somehow I went back to question one. Uh, I need to be on four if somebody can rescue me there. We did four already. That was the armored scale. Okay, I'm sorry. So something's popping out when it shouldn't. Uh, I'm gonna exit this, we're not ready for it. Okay, so 
Are you ready to do the black olive tree? Uh, I'm not that question, but I need to okay. talk about it first. So, okay. uh, sorry, South Florida, you'll see um, the severe staining. You'll think somebody's radiator blue, um, but this is due to some arthropod damage and attacking the, a lot of people call it the uh, black olive tree. This is the shade tree here. You can see the stainings right underneath the canopy outline. And uh, looking at what it sh what this tree should be called, it should actually be called the oxhorn bucida. If you look at its fruit, which is A, this is the fruit of the oxhorn bucida, versus B, this is what black olive fruit looks like. You might recall on your salads. So that's what I want on my salad, not A. So, uh, we're gonna work at changing that common name. This is a shade tree you see along the coast. I don't know we, where our, some of our participants live, so you may not be familiar with it if you're a little farther north. So you can see, uh, here's a tree on the left, uh, oxhorn bucida. I'm just gonna call it the bucida tree. No staining under the canopy. Oxhorn bucida on the right, severe staining. So for some reason, uh, the one on the right had the galls. And this homeowner got so fed up with the staining, he used to park a camper here, uh, he just cut the tree down. So we don't want people doing that. So there's a caterpillar that feeds in the canopy. It'll cause uh, skeletonizing defoliation. We've seen that already down here in the last four to six weeks and you'll see that staining on the sidewalk, and that's, that's an annoyance or category one issue. Uh, and we get calls of these caterpillars dangling down. We call it the bungee caterpillar. And um, people wanna know what to do, and by that time it's pretty, pretty far along in the biology, the life cycle, it's really not worth doing anything. The caterpillars uh, will feed on the flowers. You can see the notching on the little flower petals uh, by these tiny caterpillars. Each red dot, a uh, first in star caterpillar. So what causes the staining? Uh, a lot of people thought it was the fruit, but it's actually, uh, you get staining from the galls. These galls are caused by a tiny mite you see it's a flower gall, it looks like a green bean. So the gall alone concentrates the tannins as well as the caterpillar in its frass. So the caterpillars go from free range feeding on the foliage to second generation, they feed inside these galls, they actually become a boar. They tunnel into these galls and you kick out the frass, so to speak. And the frass causes staining as well as the galls will when they drop. But while they're hanging up there in the tree, it's kind of like an old tea bag with drip, 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 and uh, the tannins leaking out. So here's what's inside those galls, these millions of tiny little area fired mites. And you can't predict which tree they're gonna be on all the time. It's, it changes from year to year. It's not always the same tree. It's kind of erratic. So here's what causes the staining. You see all the fruit here. Fruit's concentrated in the sidewalk, crack it, but there's no staining. So what's causing the staining is the frass from the caterpillar feeding up in the canopy, as well as the galls cause staining because of the concentration of tannin. Uh, so this is a project we've done about uh, three, four years studies, a couple years in uh, Naples, a couple years at Coral Gables. And Coral Gables unfortunately had canopy tree species. Their uh, major tree was uh, the black uh, horned olive, ox, um, bucida olive, oxhorn bucida, sorry. So the street tree uh, manager was plagued with calls from the residents, so we were looking at different treatments. Okay, so question five. So if I hit the polling button. Yep. 
keeps going back to uh, question one. Okay, I got it. Did I do something? Okay, the oxhorn beside tree, otherwise known as the black olive tree, has which category one staining issues from time to time? Uh, a, every five, I don't see the A, B, C. I guess I can pick it. I don't see an A, B, C here. Do I need to do something here? Um, so, nope. Did I mess up the answer for this question? I wouldn't worry about We'll just move on because I got 500 other pests to cover. Um, <laughs> you have 10 minutes. <laughs> okay. Okay, we're gonna end the poll. Everybody knows that the stains caused by the tiny aerified mites and the galls they create. It's not, and the leaf, frass from the leaf chewing and gall tunneling caterpillars. It's not the fruit of the oxhorn beside it. Okay. Okay, moving along. Okay, so we looked at trunk injections and uh, if you have questions about how to control this or what to do, you send me an email. I can give you more details. We had some publications on this. Uh, and you can even use bleach or some other labeled solution for cleaning your sidewalk. And we have a YouTube video on that. So another uh, pest, we'll move along to another chewing pest. Uh, this is a mess above my office window outdoors, outside, looking at uh, where the Oleander caterpillars pupate. So this is a foliage damage. The oleanders, these, you don't see them every year, but some years you do. Uh, they're kind of cyclical. Uh, they also have another favorite host here with the desert rose. So we have uh, repeating generations. Here's the eggs being deposited by this beautiful wasp. It's not a wasp, but wasp, a moth. It looks like a, a wasp. And the eggs hatch into these orange and black haired caterpillars that feed together. These hairs will not sting you. They're not going to bother you. They're very soft. And there are actually two species of caterpillars. Uh, so what I'm going to do is kind of jump ahead. So this is the adult of the silver spotted oleander caterpillar. Uh, Snowbush spanworm is another one that shows up periodically and can do some serious feeding damage. And if there's no foliage, because there's repeating generations, they feed on the twigs and it almost looks like rabbit damage feeding on the twigs. Here's the uh, adult moth. So it's usually not that big a deal. Um, I mean, they might defoliate the snow bush, but it's not like you have to replace a majorly expensive plant. How much does a snow bush plant cost? Like you can get small ones for four or five dollars. So uh, to me, it's more of an annoyance. Cat one and cat two is definitely damage to the plant. Uh, here's the snow bush spanworm, the different instars. Uh, one of my favorite insect pests is the huge French panty hornworm. How many caterpillars can you count on this one? Oh, we don't have time to count. So um, moving along, uh, the adult moth is sort of a disappointment, kind of brown and gray. And uh, we started a new service at the Cuyahoga County Extension Office. Uh, if you see these, I couldn't tell people to kill them. They're like a small pet. They've got these little uh, beautiful stripes and a little black tail. So question six. Okay, I'm still not, am I supposed to thank you? Which plant should be scouted for caterpillars? I don't see an ABC. Can they still answer those? They can. They just touch on the, the answer. Yeah. And yeah. Or they have a, a radio button or they can just touch the answer and they've been doing very well at it. There should be an all of the above unless I, I left it out. Because everybody knows right now the two pest caterpillars we just covered will attack snowbush, 
and Oleander. So I'm going to end the poll if that's okay. I got some important pests to, to get to. Poll is ended, so. Okay, so this is a category pest, category three pest, serious threat is the uh, palmetto weevil or palm weevil. Uh, just one larva tunneling in near the apical meristem can do a palm tree in. And we think of moths usually releasing pheromones, but uh, some beetle species will also do that. Uh, so then I had a little dialogue on if you see holes in your uh, newly transplanted Canary Island date palm. We also see these on Bismarckias, occasionally on cabbage palms, also on Washingtonias. Uh, but they seem to prefer Canary Island date palms and uh, Bismarckias lately. So if you're seeing uh, adults emerge within a uh, it takes 84 days to go from through the life cycle. So if they attacked it after you planted it, I mean, you've got a $5,000 Canary Island date palm and you're seeing uh, holes in your fronds up top, emergence of these beetles at 50 days, you know they arrived infested. But if it's after that 84 day window, uh, they were attacked after they were installed. So a little bit of a benchmark there timing wise. So, and these are just huge larvae, and uh, we decided to come up with, you've heard of pigs in a blanket. Uh, we came up with a recipe called uh, grubs in a blanket. So, you know, when you get a lemon, make lemonade. So, uh, another important part, uh, we get, I get a lot of calls on pine bark beetles, especially after hurricanes, people see the sawdust and the pitch. In South Florida, slash pines are stressed by these high wind events and essentially the pipelines inside are being broken and they don't reconnect and it's sort of a slow death. And you can see how this isn't a pine, but you can see what things get torn apart. They call it shakes or cup shakes or ring shakes. So the Ips beetles fly to these dying pines. They are not killing the pines. I've had people spray lots and lots of pesticides on those slash pine trunks and they're just wasting their money, uh, contaminating the environment and they're not gonna save the trees. So if every Ips beetle in South Florida was killed, those pines are gonna die from those environmental stresses. Let's see, so did I have a polling question? So question number seven, pine Ips beetles do not kill slash pines, true or false? So if you kindly answer that. Do not kill slash pines. Okay, are we ready to move on? Okay, moving on. Uh, Sri Lankan weevil, I'm going to run through this fairly fast. Uh, there was some research done by one of the University of Florida people, uh, one of our district people looking at sp spinosad. Uh, spinosad seemed to have some effect, uh, maybe killed 85% of the uh, adults. So moving on to... Uh, let me go back. So remember when plumbagos used to look like that? I'm gonna skip ahead. This is chili thrips. It seems like it's kind of subsided. Uh, this shows the chalk glands on the back of plumbago leaves. It's not a disease, it's not chili thrips, but chili thrips causes stunting and malformation. It'll cause it on uh, these different plants I'm showing you. Duranta, gold mound. And here's a stunting damage. I thought it was Roundup damage at first, but they were loaded with chili thrips. And looking at uh, orange jasmine, 
being difficult to find because it is it will harbor the bacterium that causes citrus greening and okay so yeah interesting the uh, asian citrus psyllid here's the nymphs feed on the new growth of citrus as well as uh, orange jasmine and other plants in, in the citrus family and their honeydew is more like uh, soft serve ice cream it's semi-liquid and that's pretty easy to spot there's the adult okay ficus endangered uh so we had a monoculture of ficus and it's like whoever heard of problems on ficus or bulletproof well we started having problems so we had a monoculture too much which is too much of one plant species and that's going to make you it, it, you're going to be set up for a big crash when a new pest or disease insect or disease shows up so uh incredible number of ficus in south florida uh first pest was weeping ficus strips 2003 open up those folded pea pod like galls you can see it. these are huge strips compared to the chili thrips like four times bigger 2007 we had uh, blister gall wasp and this is on the cuban laurel ficus only and this fact is a good way to identify it. Uh, you can see those galls. A lot of defoliation in old Naples. Cut open those galls. You can see the cells where the wasp larvae of a Jose Fiella developed. That's what Jose Fiella adult wasp looks like. Uh, 2008, we had eye spot gall, a fly leaf miner. Here's a larva in that red circle there. I haven't seen as much of that lately. Uh, huge pest, January 2009 in uh, the Naples area. Here's a huge community surrounded, like others, by ficus, a wall of ficus hedge. And a few years later, boom, ficus whitefly is killing these. Serious category three, uh, no alternative biocontrol insects were around. And the, the people on the bottom floors at this community were kind of upset because they're right on a major road here and all of a sudden you get the sound and your privacy is lost. So here's what you look for, flip those leaves over. You'll see uh, the older stages, kind of like barnacles on a ship that hang on. The ficus whitefly adults don't live that long. So you'll usually see that symptom first. And here's what not to do. This is a community where you had ficus. I mean, they paid a landscape architect to design this. You had nothing but ficus benjamina, weeping ficus on the left, and then as a hedge in the background in the median, ficus benjamina trees, ficus benjamina on the right, ficus benjamina right hedge. So just nothing but they were decimated. And I can't imagine the treatments going out because there's a low amount of uh, systemic insecticide that you can use. It's a very low quantity. And uh, Actually, this hedge did recover. So looking at what you can do, root soil drenches with neonics, bark trunk sprays with certain neonics, trunk injections, biocontrol possibilities finally showed up. Uh, we've got green lacewing eggs, eggs on a stick. That's what I call them. That's what the uh, larva green lacewing looks like. There's the adult. And then uh, we started seeing some ladybugs, lady beetles showing up. And there's a larva of this guy. Another symptom is you'll see this mottling on the ficus benjamina. It looks like a citrus deficiency, citrus leaf deficiency, but it, you'll see this light green and dark green uh, striping almost on ficus benjamina. See it a little more pronounced there. And then finally, uh, the game breaker, game maker, is uh, this tiny little micro wasp. Uh, the stages on the ficus whitefly should be transparent. This is an immature stage of ficus whitefly, and you can see it's sort of a golden brown color. It means it's been parasitized by this guy, a micro wasp, um, scientific name. Uh, we just call it the Baleos wasp or micro wasp, parasitic wasp. So this female wasp stings the immature stages of the ficus whitefly, uh, the crawlers, second in stars, not the crawlers, but the craw second in stars and 
the egg hatches and, and you get the larval stages of the wasp developing and feeding on this ficus white fly nymph and you'll get those emerging. So we had, uh, we finally had a tag team series of biocontrol insects that I think have significantly reduced the impact of ficus white fly, but it took about uh, nine years. Two minutes to 10. I know you, Stephen. So one of the take home messages, use diversity in your hedges. So here's ficus white fly hedge on, ridden ficus hedge on the left and on the right you've got a viburnum hedge that um, was not affected. So this guy on the right say, saying, aha, you should have planted viburnum, but what are we doing now? We're planting we have monoculture of clusia. So clusia is everywhere and I don't know if there's a clusia white fly or disease waiting to show up, but you people installing hedges think diversity, get some different species in there. We have fact sheets on different edges you can use. Uh, final white fly, Rugo spiraling white fly, that coconuts. It's a giant white fly compared to the ficus white fly. Here's the two species on a penny. There's Abe Lincoln's ear. So here's the ficus white fly. The Rugo spiraling white fly is almost like a small moth. And finally, we got some biocontrol with these micro wasps that were uh, released or naturally.